Looking to buy a mid-range TV with HDMI 2.1 support? Then you may want to stick around for our review of the LG Nano 90, the 2021 edition. It replaces the Nano 90 from 2020, which we'll be comparing with throughout the video to see if this newer version is worth your money. Hi, I'm Ryan, a lead tester at Ratings.com, where we help you find the best product for your needs. We'll look at the design of the TV, the inputs, and the smart features. We'll then go through our results to show you how it performs according to usage. We'll start with movies and HDR movies, followed by TV shows and sports, and finally, gaming, HDR gaming, and PC use. At the end, we'll show you how it scores overall and our verdict. We'll also be comparing to other competing TVs that are currently available. Finally, we'll answer some questions you asked us through hashtag AskRatings. We handpicked some of them and I'll address them later in the video, so stick around for that. We bought the 55 inch model to test, but it's also available in 65, 75 and 86 inch sizes. We expect all of them to have very similar picture quality. The naming is a bit confusing because it essentially has the same name as the 2020 model and is available in the same sizes. The easiest way to tell them apart is to look at the release year or the model number. The 2020 model has a model number that ends with UNA and the 2021 model ends with UPA. Before we get to the test results, let's just take a tour of the TV and look at the design. It looks a lot like the 2020 model, but the feet have been redesigned to take up less space. They're still set wide apart though, so you still need a fairly wide surface to put it on. If you want to wall mount it, you need a VESA 300 by 300 mount, which is different from the 600 by 400 on last year's model. As you can see, the back is plain, and you have most of the inputs facing sideways, so they're easy to access when it's mounted. And because it's a pretty thin TV, it's not going to stick out much. Build quality is good, better than the 2020 model. There's still some flex in the middle of the back panel and near the inputs, but this shouldn't be a problem for most people once the TV is set up. The feet are very sturdy, so there's almost no wobble at all. In terms of inputs, we have four HDMIs, three USBs, a digital optical out, a coaxial for older devices, and an ethernet port. HDMI 3 and 4 are the HDMI 2.1 ports, and the number 3 port is also the eARC port. eARC basically lets you pass high quality uncompressed audio to an external sound system or soundbar. The problem with it being shared with the HDMI 2.1 port is that if you have two devices with HDMI 2.1 support, like a PS5 and an Xbox Series X, then you can only connect one with a soundbar or sound system unless your audio system supports 4K at 120 pass-through. The last thing we're going to look at before getting into the test results is the smart features. It still runs on LG's WebOS, but the interface looks a bit different. You now get a full home page with no banner at the bottom. It's easy to navigate around and run smoothly for the most part. We didn't experience any bugs while testing. There are ads and suggested content here and there on the home page and in the app store, and unfortunately, there's no way to disable them. The remote got a makeover from last year's model. You get mostly the same functions, and you can still use it like a pointer or a regular remote, it just looks a bit different. LG added a couple of quick access buttons at the bottom, like Disney Plus, LG Channels, as well as buttons to summon the Google Assistant and Alexa for voice control. You can use your voice to search for content, ask for things like the weather, or launch an app, but you can't change settings like brightness or contrast. If you're like me, you'll miss the pause and play buttons from the old remote that are missing this time around, but most people pause by clicking the middle scroll wheel anyway. For an updated comparison with new models as we buy and test them, see the review page on our website, which is linked here. All right, let's move on to the main event. As mentioned earlier, we're going to review the TV according to usage, starting with the movies and HDR movies categories. But before we do that, we just want to be clear that the things we associate as good for a particular use are based on assumptions and what we think most people do with their TVs. So some stuff might not be relevant to your particular use or setup. Okay, our first topic is contrast, the difference between the deepest black and the brightest white. For watching movies or almost any content, it's one of the most important aspects of picture quality. 
This is especially important if you watch movies in the dark, because you want blacks to look black, not grey. A high contrast ratio also means that the TV can display dark colors better without losing detail. In this aspect, the Nano 90 is mediocre, which is expected for an IPS panel, and in the same ballpark as the 2020 model. The local dimming doesn't really improve the contrast with our test pattern, but it does when we displayed a full white and full black screen, which came out to a contrast of 52,250 to 1. This is not representative of real world usage, but it at least confirms that the local dimming can fully turn off the backlight when needed. As for the local dimming performance, it's pretty disappointing. There are only 32 dimming zones, and the transition between the zones are visible. The 2020 model made everything brighter, but on the 2021 model, it just crushes everything, which means you lose detail in the dark and very bright areas. And on top of that, there's a lot of blooming around bright objects. Black uniformity is also an essential aspect of picture quality, especially for dark rooms. But this comes down to luck, because uniformity varies between individual units. Without local dimming, our unit has clouding throughout, and the entire screen looks purple. It's better overall with local dimming enabled, but you can see that there's noticeable blooming around the test cross. If you watch a lot of HDR movies, then it's important that the TV has a good color gamut and color volume to produce a more impressive image. Unfortunately, this is one area that is a downgrade from the previous model. The color gamut is narrower and doesn't actually cross our threshold to be considered a wide color gamut. That being said, it's not that far off. The color volume is also a downgrade. It basically has trouble displaying dark colors because of its low contrast, and it struggles with bright blues too, which is typical for LCD TVs. By the way, the tone mapping is really off because our unit is not very well calibrated out of the box, which is definitely noticeable in real life. In the expert dark space SDR picture mode, white balance and colors are visibly inaccurate. The color temperature is on the cool side, so the image has a slight bluish tint, and the gamma is just all over the place and makes everything too bright. In HDR, the overall brightness is around 550 nits in real scenes. It can get much brighter, especially for smaller highlights, but only for a short period, which means that the image dims the longer it stays on screen. You can see that we measured well over 1000 nits on a 10% peak window, but it drops to 442 nits in the sustained measurement. The last two things that we're going to touch on in this category are stutter and judder. This TV has fast response times, so low frame rate content like movies can stutter a bit because each frame is held on screen for longer. If the stuttering really bothers you, you can use motion interpolation to smooth it out. As for judder, that's caused by the mismatch between the content and the TV's refresh rate, and it's most noticeable in panning shots. The Nano 90 can remove judder from all sources, so that's one thing you don't have to worry about. So, what's it like to watch movies and HDR movies on the Nano 90? It's just okay. It's losing points mainly because it has a low contrast ratio and the local dimming performs poorly. If you mostly watch movies on your TV and you watch in a dark room, then you're probably better off with a VA panel or an OLED. By the way, before we continue with the rest of the video, if you enjoy our content, please make sure you subscribe to our channel for the latest videos and check out our website for the full review and more. By subscribing, you're helping us reach a wider audience and in turn helping us help you all find the best product for your needs. Remember to stick around until the end of the video where I'll answer some user questions. All right, let's get to the TV shows and sports categories, starting with the SDR brightness and reflection handling. Obviously, this mainly applies to those watching in a well-lit environment. If you mostly watch TV in the dark, then this doesn't apply. Overall, the Nano 90 gets bright enough in SDR content for most lighting conditions, but not quite enough for that really bright sunny room. The same can be said of the reflection handling. It's great, but you can see in our test photo that it still struggles a bit with direct reflections. Next up are the viewing angles. This is important if you have, for example, a seating arrangement that forces you to watch at an angle, or you want to exercise on a cardio machine in the corner of the room while watching. Having good viewing angles makes the experience better because the image doesn't look washed out from the sides. Typically, IPS TVs have pretty good viewing angles, but on the Nano 90, it's just okay. Colors fade pretty quickly when you move off-center, and the image also looks dimmer from the side. Now, to the big topic of response time, which is how fast a pixel can change from one color to another. This is going to affect fast-moving content like sports, video games, and PC use. The Nano 90 performs well in this regard, about the same as the 2020 model. Fast motion looks reasonably clear, but there's still a small blur trail behind fast-moving objects. 
there's a black frame insertion feature that you can use to improve motion clarity. The TV does this by flickering the backlight to simulate inserting a black frame between each frame. It can flicker at 60Hz and 120Hz depending on the content, but you might see some image duplications caused by crosstalk. You can also use motion interpolation to make motion look smoother, otherwise known as the soap opera effect. The Nano 9D can interpolate 30fps content up to 60fps and 60fps up to 120fps, but strangely not 30 to 120. At the time of this video, this might be a bug that gets fixed, but for the moment 30fps content interpolates only up to 60fps. How does it look? It's not that great in general. It causes some motion artifacting and ghosting, and it stops interpolating altogether in more intense scenes. Last up is the grey uniformity. Like black uniformity that we talked about earlier, this really comes down to the panel lottery. The most common thing that you'll see on a panel with bad uniformity is darker corners and edges, and what we refer to as the dirty screen effect in the middle, or DSE. DSC is particularly distracting when watching sports or anything with a large area of uniform color. Our Nano 90 has both dark corners and DSC in the middle, but again, this varies between units. So overall, the Nano 90 is good for watching TV shows and sports. The only thing that might be an issue for some are the viewing angles. If that's the case, you should probably look at something else. Now, let's talk about gaming and gaming in HDR. We just went over the response times, and the Nano 90 is great at that. The other thing that's important for gaming is, of course, input lag. The Nano 90 performs very well here, even better than the 2020 model. There's also a new feature this year called Prevent Input Delay, and it can reduce input latency by about 3 milliseconds at 60 Hz, but it has no effect at 120 Hz. This is because it can play 60 Hz content at 120 Hz, but it doubles every frame. This in turn means that the image scans out as if it's 120 Hz, which theoretically should result in around 3 to 4 milliseconds of improvement in the input lag at the center of the screen. As we mentioned earlier, there are two HDMI 2.1 ports, which means it can display a 4K at 120 Hz signal. The higher refresh rate basically makes gaming feel smoother and more responsive if you have a compatible HDMI 2.1 device. The Nano 90 supports variable refresh rate to reduce screen tearing, and that includes HDMI Forum VRR, FreeSync and G-Sync compatibility. As for console compatibility, it can do pretty much everything on the PS5 and Xbox Series X. The only thing to note here is that the PS5 itself doesn't have VRR support yet. The disappointing local dimming, which we've already talked about in the movies section, is about the same in game mode. The color temperature is a bit cooler, so colors pop a bit more, but it otherwise performs the same as outside of game mode. And the same goes for HDR brightness, it performs just like it does outside of game mode. So, all things considered, the Nano 90 is a good TV for gaming, whether it's in SDR or HDR. Of course, it's not the best choice for gaming in the dark because of the low contrast. Again, you want to go with a VA panel or OLED for better darkroom performance. Our last usage category is PC monitor, and we're going to start with supported resolutions. The Nano 90 supports all common resolutions, including 1440p, but it can only do it at 120Hz natively, which means you need to force a custom resolution at 60Hz. Having support for various resolutions doesn't really impact general desktop use, it's mostly for gamers in case they want to drop the resolution of a game to achieve higher frame rates. It can display proper Chroma 444 if you want to use that for better text clarity, you just need to set the input as PC. While we're on the subject of text clarity, you should know that the Nano 90 uses a BGR subpixel layout. This doesn't affect picture quality, but you might get text fringing in some applications that are coded for an RGB layout. You can read more about it in our article here. For those who are sensitive to backlight flicker, the Nano 90 is flicker free if you set the brightness to max. It uses PWM at lower brightness levels to dim the backlight, but the flickering is so high that most people shouldn't notice it. The flicker only drops to 120Hz when in the game optimizer mode or game mode. What do we think of the Nano 90 as a PC monitor? It's actually great. The only things that might bother some people are the viewing angles because the sides may look inaccurate if you sit up close, and the BGR subpixel layout. Before we get to our final results and the verdict, let's just talk about the sound quality of the built-in speakers. They're decent, and they get pretty loud. They don't have much bass extension for that deep, rumbling sound, and the very prominent high bass can make things a bit muddy. There are bumps in the high, mid, and low treble to bring voices forward, so you should get very clear dialogues. There's a fair amount of distortion at max volume, but this depends a lot on content, and some people may not even hear it.
All right, it's time to tally up everything and give our mix usage score. This score combines everything that we talked about, but just keep in mind that it's also based on what we think most people do with their TVs, so it might not apply to you. Overall, we gave the LG Nano 90, the 2021 model, a 7.5. You can see the breakdown in our graph here, which brings us our final verdict. If you mostly watch movies and HDR movies, the Nano 90 is okay. You're going to miss out on the deep blacks when watching in a dark room, and the local dimming performs poorly. You might want to get it calibrated because color accuracy is pretty bad out of the box. For TV shows and sports, it's good, but the viewing angles are not that great for an IPS panel, which means the image looks washed out when viewed from the side. It's also good for gaming or gaming in HDR, but again, if you tend to play video games in the dark, this is not the best option for that. And finally, for use as a PC monitor, the Nano 90 is excellent because it supports most resolutions and Chroma 444. The only thing that might bother some people is the BGR subpixel layout. Compared to the Nano 90 from 2020, last year's model, it's about the same. The 2021 model gets brighter in SDR and HDR, but takes a step backward when it comes to color gamut and color accuracy. Against the Samsung Q80A, the Samsung comes out ahead because it gets a lot brighter in SDR and HDR, and it has wider viewing angles, wider color gamut, and better color accuracy. If you want to see a list of the TVs that we've reviewed and compare them, then you can do so easily with our table tool. It's a quick way to see how the TVs score, and you can change the parameters to show exactly what you're looking for. You can find the table tool here. Now, it's time for our new hashtag ask rating section, where we answer your questions pertaining to the product in the current video. In this case, we're curious to know what questions you had regarding the Nano 90 2021. Let's take a look at some of your questions now. Question one from Facebook, Carol Manda asked us, how long does it maintain the peak brightness? 2020 Nano 90 dropped off a bit after a minute or so. If this happens as well, how does it affect HDR? Good question. We don't have an exact measurement as to how long it maintains the brightness. We can only say that it's longer than on the previous model. It shouldn't affect HDR content that much because most scenes don't remain on the screen for that long. Chances are that the scene would have changed by the time the brightness drops. The second question is from our Nano 90 written review. User Patapi asks us, hello. By chance during the AMD FreeSync test, did you not encounter flickering? I noticed it with my 6900 XT. The answer is no. We didn't see any flickering during our FreeSync test. So that's it. What do you think of the LG Nano 90 2021? Is the Nano 90 going to be on your must-buy list? Let us know below. Also, we're a growing company and are expanding into other product categories. As a result, we are currently hiring in our offices in Montreal for various positions. So, if you want to help people find the best product for their needs, have a look at the careers page on our website. You can check out all of the measurements on our website. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel. You can also become an insider on the website for early access to our latest results. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Thank you.